It's a real pleasure for me to, uh, to host Marcel here. Uh, he lives most of the year in France, um, although in his life he's lived in France, Germany, and America, where uh, he uh, went to high school, uh, uh, amongst other things. College, went to Occidental College, right? Sorry. You went to Occidental College? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. And so Not at the same time as President Obama. Different. Little early. <laughs> Little early. Uh, and so in today's, uh, in the two hours we have today, um, I, have, I have a few clips that I've pulled from some of Marcel's films as kind of touch points uh, for us to think about uh, some of what makes his films extraordinary to me. And I want to uh, spend some of today putting those films in perspective into the context of the times uh, that they were made. And I also want to spend some time uh, trying to take away some lessons from uh, these several decades of, uh, of filmmaking that you put in. And, and uh, along the way, I, uh, you know, maybe halfway into this, I'll encourage um, the, uh, the people in the room to raise their hands and ask questions, and we can you know, make this more of a dialogue um, uh, midway through. Um, uh, you know, the, the, what brings Marcel here uh, this week is the extraordinary restoration of his film, uh, Memory of Justice. So, you know, the, the films that are probably best known of Marcel's are Sorrow and the Pity um, uh, from 1971, I think, and then the, and the, the second really uh, major work after that was Memory of Justice in 1976. There was other work in between, but uh, I think that is a real standout. And then the third one uh, that I think has had the most prominence in, um, in the US is Hotel Terminus, which came out in the late 1980s and uh, went on to win an Academy Award. And in some ways, like, those three films can be seen as a kind of trilogy, although I don't think they ever, was, certainly wasn't intentional from the get-go uh, no. uh, to do that. <laughs> so let me, let me start with Sorrow and the Pity. Sorrow and the Pity, you made after you had made a couple fiction films um, following in the footsteps of your father, Max Ophuls. Mm -hmm. uh, no? <laughs> I no. I, Already I the contrariness uh, arises. Uh, I don't really want to contradict you directly, but the idea of my father's uh, feet uh, were too big for me to even get the idea that I could be in his footsteps. It was that's, a family that's, profession. That's, that's why Fair. I said no. Uh, with feet this big, you can't follow in footsteps this big. So you had um, you'd made a couple uh, fiction films in, uh, in France. Uh, the second one, in your own words, was? Bad. Uh, well, uh, if we talk about that. Uh, Actually, thanks to François Truffaut and the friendship of François Truffaut, the first thing I did was a sketch, the German sketch as it happened, to a film called Love at 20. That wasn't bad. It was okay, I think. Uh, the best sketch was his, not, not the other three or four. Uh, Antoine and Colette is wonderful. But, uh, then I got the opportunity to make a film with, again, uh, through the friendship with Truffaut, I get, got to know Jean Moreau. And we did a comedy that was successful, was not so much, I'm not a member of the new wave, I never was. For one thing, I'm already too old for that. I was already a bit old to be a member of the new wave. But it, it wasn't, it, so much uh, uh, director's film, actors. It was a, film, a comedy actor. And it was successful. And after that, uh, we had the plan of doing another Belmondo Moral film, and, and they were off. Jean was off filming with Orson Welles, and, and I went, and, and we, we got them. There weren't enough, again, it was a matter of groceries, as it so often is. And so 
I took on a film that uh, where the director had uh, was sick, and I took it on, and it was a film with Eddie Constantine that I did uh, yeah, for. And, and that was indeed a very bad film. And, uh, and it so I didn't been, find any sort of work. closed doors for you in fiction, and so and it so I went created into a document, not really right away in documentaries, but into journalism on French television. And out of the three years of work, it was about three years, I learned, or think I hope I learned, uh, journal, about journalism. So when the time came when the uh, when that crew working in television was offered the opportunity of doing contemporary history programs, I was the one who was assigned to do them. And uh, uh, so it was uh, first before the Sound of Pity. They, they were two evenings. You know, there's a lot of talk. Why are the films long and so forth? Well. Because the original commission was not for a long film in one evening, it was separate evening. And the first one was about the Munich Agreement, 1938. And that was successful. And so we just did the follow up, which turned out to be the song The Pity. Except that in between time, I don't want to give a lot of autobiography here, but in between time, there had been 1968. And Henri Aris and Alain de Sedoui, who were my bosses in television, and Henri Aris is the co author of the song, because we did the interviews together, uh, the, um, we were among the strike leaders so against for, the, for, the French for monopoly. young people in the audience, just to contextualize this, this is 1968 in Paris. There's uh, student uprisings, the, Uprising. the, the closed and we universities. Were, and uh, among the strikers. As a matter of fact, we must have been prominent strikers since we were the only that ones that were fired. <laughs> so that seems to lead to the conclusion that we must have been rather active. And so then I went to work for German television. And, uh, uh, and after a while, we, I thought, well, let's just take up that project since we had prepared it and found all the locations and people. And so then. So Sarah and the Pity winds up really originating on a German yes, TV. Yes, yes. Which you know, we tried think of it as such a French film. keep a secret for quite a while because, uh, in the French climate of that of that period, it wouldn't have been a terribly popular thing to admit that we were also mostly financed by German television. So, Sound the Pity, it's been made roughly 25 years after the end of World War II, yes. and. Um, and the message that Sour and the Pity is delivering in broad strokes is that France during the war was not, everyone was not a resistance fighter. Uh, there was a lot of gray area in the world of collaboration. And in fact, even some of the resistance fighters um, uh, were, were, had a complicated experience. Um, uh, like within, Francois Mitterrand. Who, who an was an example no, of no. that. Yes. Uh, uh, that were on one side at the beginning and then shifted side as the war shifted side, perhaps. <laughs> but, uh, uh, Tom, if some things are, I think, in, in current affairs and in politics and in history occur at a certain time, if we hadn't done it, somebody else would have done it sooner or later. Because it, the, 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 at that time, the Gaulist communist idea that indeed the whole country had resisted the invader was, was no, it wasn't tenable anymore. Tenable, is that a word? Yeah, tenable. Uh, tenable anymore. Uh, the time had come uh, for that just as 1968 
happen not by accident. Uh, uh, that film and also the book that Robert Paxson wrote at that time, which we didn't even know because it was sim simultaneously uh, La France de Vichy. Uh, uh, it, it had to happen. Uh, These ideas the, are, the, are the, bubbling the up. The Smiths was so, had become uh, totally unrealistic and no, no, no longer believable. So, so you, made this, you made this four-hour film uh, with German t TV money, and then... Not only, also. With other... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and then when it comes time to try to air it on French television, you hit, hit a roadblock. Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, the, uh, and, and that became a scandal in itself, uh, the fact that uh, uh, tele uh, the French television, who had originally uh, given us the film to make, didn't want to do it. Uh, there's perhaps an anecdote uh, in connection with that. By that time, de Gaulle was no longer a president of the Fifth Republic. He had just recently retired. And the director general of French TV went to see him to talk about the film and said to him about that they were offered to buy this documentary about the occupation of France. And uh, uh, the general asked him, well, what's in the film? And, and the director general said, I wasn't there, but there are witnesses, said uh, some disagreeable truths, mon général. And uh, the general answered, uh, the French don't need truth, they need hope. Which I think is a beautiful, beautiful thing. But let's just say that, that uh, General de Gaulle and I don't have the, didn't have the same job. It's a different job. Yours is Journalism the job to tell the truth. the same job as being a leader in politics. So, blocked from French TV, the, you, you, with Francois Truffaut's help, take the film into movie theaters. Yes. Again, in large part, thanks to Francois Truffaut. Uh, there was also a board of censors in uh, four, my God, when you think back on a Gaullist France was, full of censorship. I mean, Paths of Glory, Stanley Kubrick's film, was uh, banned from France for some 15 years. But then Stanley, it wasn't as big a deal for Stanley Kubrick as it was for us being banned. Uh, <laughs> he didn't have all that much at stake. I mean, Paths of Glory is a magnificent film. Anyway, so uh, uh, the, uh, they, 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 it, it had, yes, there's also a censorship board for films at that time. And Truffaut wanted the film to come out and he appointed two colleagues of his in the Cahier du Cinéma, one very far left, communist and another one pretty far right to the right so they would shove the obstacles aside and again the uh, Emmanuel Roy, the, the, the woman who prepared for that screening she was someone who worked with Truffaut or, hmm? she worked with Truffaut yes yeah uh, she was with the Cahier du Cinéma at the time. And uh, she makes up the reels on purpose so that the people looking at it would think, well, this is something for intellectual. It can do no harm. <laughs> and uh, really. And uh, that, of course, helped them uh, so got get, the get approved to be shown in a French cinema. 
Yes. And where it played for 18 months. At first on the left bank in a small theater, and then the theater, other theaters got bigger, and then it played on the Champs-Élysées. And it was extremely successful. But it took another 12 years for the film to be shown on television. And in fact, it was uh, when the socialists, when Mitterrand came to power, they had promised in advance to journalists that the Sauron de Pity would be shown because it was that big an issue in France. Uh, the journalists were constantly asking the heads of state and the people in charge, the prime minister, when are you going to put it on television? And they had promised to put it on television. I happen to know that Mitterrand didn't like the film at all, but it is, there are two, at least two promises that he kept. One, which seems to me to be the more important one, is the abol abolition of capital punishment. And the other one is the sort of pity. <laughs> kept at least those two promises. Okay, well, that's the story. Yeah. The so uh, let, I know in this room there's probably a range of people who have seen some of Marcel's work or, or haven't. How many people have seen Sorrow and the Pity uh, in the room? It's not, you're not being judged or uh, counted. Okay. Um, well, I want to show a, uh, a clip from Sorrow and the Pity, especially for those of you who haven't seen it. This is uh, a clip from the second half of the film where you are interviewing some former resistance fighters, the, uh, known as the Grave brothers, uh, uh, Alexis and, uh, and Louis uh, Grave. And so we've got, it's about a three minute clip, and Christian, if you wanna. So there's a few things that I want to ask about in, uh, in that clip. Um, one is, uh, You've described to me that one of your pleasures of making documentary films, and I think one thing that you have a special skill at, is being able to interview people from the very top of, uh, of status and hierarchy to... Uh, to society. Yeah, of, yeah. yeah uh, to the lowest, and, and you get this range. Um, and, I mean, I wonder if you can just start by telling us you know, the background to, to doing that interview with... Um, with the Graf yeah, Brothers? Yeah, with the Graf Brothers. Oh. Uh, the, um, when we had decided on the town, uh, the next job was to go to the local newspaper. It's mostly through the newspaper La Montagne, which during the occupation was Pierre Laval's newspaper, that, uh, that we got names uh, uh, and, uh, and went to meet people, find out, and then put them in the film or not. Uh, the, the source of, of where to find them as far as Clermont-Ferrand is concerned. The, the is town that you well, well, focus on. But yes, the town that was chosen for several reasons. Uh, uh, so, uh, yes, and uh, to a great extent that was André Harris who had the relationship two people on that. Notion. Your producer on the uh, project. Well, uh, producer on, on and co-author. I mean, the interview, the, the clip you just showed, all the questions, uh, I haven't seen the film. <laughs> all the questions are Andre. It's Andre, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is not always the case. I mean, you asked me that before in the green room. Uh, Whoever, uh, whoever seemed to have the closer connection or found the people, we would just, uh, uh, so sometimes he did, sometimes I did, and sometimes we both did. In this case, we both did, but this particular part of the interview is, uh, he's the one who asks the question. And uh, yes, to the question of uh, how we found them, 
there is always a matter of scouting and, and looking for people who might be. And of course, that's a whole job in itself. And I've never attempted to do it all by myself because uh, different places, different uh, stories call for different techniques of approach and of finding the people you need. Something else that strikes me about that scene is that it has this wonderful casual feel. You know, yeah. there's wine bottles on the table, Indeed, people are yes. chiming in, people are walking in the door. Ma and many times documentary filmmakers are trying to control Try to their the interview. Up. Right. Or, you know, trying uh, to shut the door, close uh, make it, make it sure no one comes in. Yeah. More and more respectable. Yes. Well, that reminds me of the fact that, again, it, it still is a controversial film in France. And one of the people who hates the film so much that in the short memoirs she has written, a remarkable person for whom I have the greatest respect, really great respect, is Simone Weil, who is one of the Auschwitz survivors and a very important one. And in her uh, short autobiography, she takes three and a half pages to denounce the film out of perhaps 100 pages. Well, rather surprising after more than 40 years. Uh, so why do I bring it up? Because How it's one of the does things she spend that on Lenny came... So? How many pages does she spend on Lenny Riefenstahl? Interesting question. None <laughs> at all. <laughs> not at all. Uh, well, I mean, her, it's it's not it's not a subject matter. It's it's because she feels that the film created a counter myth to the Gaulish myth uh, that uh, that the film seems to show or imply that uh, that the French were inactive or, or cowardly or whatever. I can't interpret her uh, on and it's uh, always, but she's not the only one. Uh, a whole book has been written against the film called uh, uh, called Le Chagrin et le Venin, uh, which means the sorrow and the poison, written by a fairly good historian, incidentally. I mean, a good historian. But just to finish on the Simone Weil story, uh, when, when it became apparent that she was a very central figure in, not, in prohibiting the showing of the film on television, because we were talking about the model of the one, at some point I said, well, uh, perhaps if she had been in charge or an assistant on the film, the first thing she would have done is take the wine bottles out of the frame. Uh, long story for a rather short end, but uh, yes, the idea of of cleaning up documentaries so they will look more historic. Yes, I do think they have a this. Also, the idea well, resistance people at the lower part of society are communists and drunks perhaps both communists and drunks. All these, uh, all these ideas that swim around this film are, are, are strange and bizarre because it cut across something that so many people didn't want to. That myth that so many people had an interest in not exploding or not, and all resenting, you know. Uh, if you don't like the message, shoot the message. The song and the pity has very much to do with that, if you don't. Uh, but I'm still here, so the, <laughs> they didn't shoot me. Or they didn't succeed in shooting me. And anyway, that's only a joke. Uh, but uh, yes, the casual and the, the atmosphere. The, the Graf brothers, actually, it's one. They're, they're always together. But Alex, Alex 
there's an, hardly any talking. It's really Louis, Louis Grant, is yeah. the one with it. And he is a fabulous character. And uh, one doesn't know that in advance, his eyes. I noticed that you were amused at the end when there's a sort of a freeze frame. Uh, and when it becomes obvious that he does have an answer mm. to that particular that the other Have ones don't want, French that French. he just suppresses the answer. He's a, he is, he was a great human being. He was a, he is indeed, I think, the hero of the film. I think that Louis is a, and a, just another small anecdote. When the film finally was put on television, and seen by, I think, uh, four million people, which at the time was huge. Just in France. Wow. Yes, in France. It's been seen in many other countries, in BBC and not. But when, uh, when it was finally shown, some journalists uh, the day after went down and tried to find the witness and interview them. And somebody did show up at the grass and so Louis was asked, ah, did you see the film? And his answer was, if you think we've got the time to look at four-hour films, you're crazy. <laughs> now, something that strikes me is in the, 19, in the early 1970s when this is made, a, certainly a, a big part of American documentary filmmaking was uh, for the director to not be in the frame, to be an observer of, uh, of what was going on. And I presume that... Direct cinema, cinema verite. Exactly. And I presume that some of the aesthetics of this film, where, where you're sometimes in the frame asking a question, kind of come out of the, the tradition of television news that... Absolutely. That sort of That's began. the answer. Yeah. It's a... I got into this specialty and into this way of trying to tell a story because at the beginning I was asked to do it. And then I kept in that. But yes, indeed, uh, the question is very legitimate indeed. Um, an illustration, there was animosity. Uh, my great friend, who would, as you know, Tom, uh, my friend, uh, who is part of the tradition and a very prominent one, is Fred Wiseman. Uh, it was never an issue to us because we were friends for other reasons, for personal reasons. Uh, but yes, I'm told that, I was told by several people that Richard Leacock felt so strongly an antagonism toward my form of filmmaking that uh, in the mirror where he shaved every morning, he had a photograph of me with a clown's, with a clown's uh, red nose on it. And, but when we met, we were on good terms. But yes, there was an animosity vis-a-vis uh, -vis with the, toward that kind of. Uh, and do you, do you feel that your presence in your films increased over th the years? Yes. I mean, certainly in, in Hotel yes. Terminus, um, uh, much more you're, you're very uh, uh, much, much in there. And, and I think that, you know, I think Michael Moore cites uh, some of those films as, uh, as an influence on him to, that you know, gave him a kind of feeling that you could put oh, yourself in. And you see, that it, then it must not all be bad. <laughs> there must be some good side to that, since uh, if, if Michael says that, um, yes. I think yes. Uh, I don't think I've had uh, any influence, good or bad, on, on the people who, who, who think that they should not get involved. But it raises the whole issue, in fact, about, and again, we're about journalism. Is there such a thing as objectivity? 
I don't think there is. And once I think that all approaches, journalistic, film approaches, are the, uh, the, 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 the central and, and determinant thing is le regard, the eye of the beholder. It's the, the beholder is very important. And once you, you have that position, which is mine, basically, then why shouldn't you be in the frame? Oh, then it becomes a matter of, well, perhaps here yes and there no. It no longer be, is an issue, if it ever was. But yes, it's still around, the, uh, very much around, the idea that uh, you have a sort of anonymous window on reality uh, that gives that gives the camera that you work with and the frame that you work with uh, prestige and the state status that no camera in the world deserves. Now, you don't so. You don't believe in objectivity, but I, but I do think a, a hallmark of your films no, is making an effort of, of talking to both sides. So ah. there's you know, lots of times when we think of point of view filmmaking, we think, oh, well, you know, here's someone with a point of view, and they're only talking to the people that uh, uh, agree with them. That's one um, danger, yes. And uh, well, I mean, maybe as I lead into this conversation, I should uh, cue up uh, the next clip, which is a, a clip from uh, memory of Justice. Now, probably, has anyone in this room seen Memory of Justice? You probably maybe you went got to go see it. Did you see it yesterday? Or yeah. No, it's not in Bologna. You, you saw, oh, it's on Bologna. Okay, well. Yes, uh, in Bologna. Okay, very good. So there's a couple, but understand this that, gentleman resents me for not having been in Bologna. <laughs> <laughs> no, he really does. Uh, no, let me point this out. Uh, I, I'm I'm uh, 87, going on 88. And this was in the middle of a terrific heat wave. And uh, he, we even had a conversation where you could, he said to me, you could have used the arcades. The, in Bologna, it's a beautiful city, which indeed it is. They have those arcades. I could have walked in the shade. I didn't go to Bologna, sir, because I, 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 I'm not in the habit of following this or any other film everywhere where it's being shown. But uh, yes, I was invited, I had accepted, and I, I uh, uh, Couldn't make it, but you're here at the School of Visual Arts. Squeezed so. out, <laughs> uh, because of the heat. So, uh, so Memory of Justice has, uh, thanks to Martin Scorsese's Film Foundation, is Margaret here still? Yeah. Oh, there she is, uh, uh, Margaret Bodie, I have to uh, acknowledge. Um, Indeed, did yes. Super human work um, at, uh, helping to restore this film uh, along with the Academy. The uh, Film Foundation. Uh, uh, and thank God for the Film Foundation and thank God also for Martin Scorsese who is the uh, great filmmaker, film fan, the greatest film fan and filmmaker you could possibly imagine in the world. So the restoration has only been scantily screened. It was at the Berlin Film Festival, the Bologna Film Festival, Toronto Film Festival, yesterday at the New York Film Festival. And Under the arcade. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, soon, we hope, will uh, b become um, available in circulation uh, in universities and, uh, and other educational institutions in ways that's still being worked out. But so Memory of Justice uh, kind of took its inspiration from a book by Telford Taylor, who was a prosecutor at Nuremberg, an American prosecutor at Nuremberg. And, uh, and in the 1970s, during the Vietnam War, Telford Taylor was asking himself the question, asked himself in the, question, the question in a book called Nuremberg and Vietnam, that if we believe in the- An American tragedy. An American tragedy. Well, no, no, the, 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 the subtitle is important, an American tragedy, because the question does come if you have Du recul, if you're uh, given 
It wasn't just a tragedy for the Americans, was it? It was also a tragedy for the Vietnamese. Well, well anyway, okay. So yes, Alfred Taylor, terrific guy. And, and so Taylor is asking the question, if we believe in the principles of justice at Nuremberg, what does that mean yes. for America uh, in, in Vietnam? So taking that as a seat of inspiration, you set off making memory of justice. And uh, I would, you know, the, the, the themes that are we've woven through this film is first try examining what happened at, at Nuremberg, uh, at the Nuremberg trials after World War II. How did a process of justice, how was a process of justice arrived at to, to, to judge the war criminals of the Nazi regime. And then other layers, contemporary in the 1970s when the film was made, uh, looking at the, uh, the, the conversations taking place uh, over Vietnam War resistors and, uh, and how, um, uh, how America was going to come to grips with its involvement in Vietnam also how France should come to grips with its involvement in, in, uh, Algeria. in Algeria. So the clip I'm, uh, I pulled to show now, we, we talked before about the, Marcel's range of interviewing people from you know, the lower echelons of society to the upper echelons. Here we uh, you see Marcel talking to people uh, from the, uh, the, who once occupied uh, the highest power in um, in Nazi Germany, where he interviews uh, Albert Speer and uh, Karl uh, Dernitz, um, the uh, Nazi naval command, Nazi architect, Speer, and naval commander. And Minister of Armaments. Speer. Yeah. Speer was Minister of Armaments, who was one of those most powerful. And uh, uh, Hitler had, had thought of him as his successor. At the end, they didn't get along anymore for reasons that we won't go into. But anyway, uh, yes, so Speer is, was extremely very high up in the Nazi hierarchy. So uh, let's watch that three-minute uh, clip of, of, the, of these interviews from yes. Memory of Justice. Oh. I want to ask you, you know, your family, had to flee the Nazis from Germany and France and over the Pyrenees and to America. And now here you are with the opportunity to confront two of the biggest uh, surviving Nazis. What, how do you prepare yourself for that kind of interview? By uh, reading, doing research, reading. Well, uh, it seemed once, once I had reached, and this was before even reading Nuremberg in Vietnam and uh, Telford Theta, once I thought uh, the original idea came because I thought, after all, okay, there's all this controversy about the song and the pity, uh, but after all, National Socialism didn't originate in France. Uh, France was invaded. And, and perhaps I should look, yes, in my own background, but principally the idea that, uh, and then by and by it came the idea that Nuremberg would be the right framework for doing it, uh, looking into the German past and how, how how National Socialism happened, then what the Nuremberg Trials, and then the consequences of the Nuremberg Trials, the principle of Nuremberg, which obviously brought us to Algeria and, and Vietnam. But um, Spare, once that framework was decided upon, it was almost goes without saying that uh, the survivor of the defendants should appear in the film. Actually, there were three survivors. In, in, in that most of the Nazis who were tried at Nuremberg were sentenced to death and Yes, hung. a great many of them were hanged and therefore were unavailable. <laughs> 
Uh, and so the three that three, were possible. Yes. The path, uh, there was a third one who was the head of the and the uh, the head of the uh, uh, Nazi youth part, uh, Hitler Youth, uh, was half American and who asked to be paid quite a considerable sum. Uh, he wasn't the most interesting one anyway, but he wanted ten thousand dollars, so we didn't do it. Okay, but uh, yes, Dönitz, whatever my own feelings about it were. Once you do a film about Nuremberg and Spare is still around to be interviewed, it's, it's quite voluntarily that at the beginning, he is, I ask him, how many have you? Because he was available to everyone, journalists and cameras, and when he came out of his 20 years in Spandau. Now, why that was so, well, there are many various theories on that. But uh, your question was uh, how, Considering so that when, I have a Jewish you, background, huh? that is and, the and, question. And not, you know, not even the specifics of that, but I'm just thinking about, well, it is you know, pretty specific. Well, sure. Yeah. But I'm just thinking about preparing for any kind of intimidating interview. Oh, I hardly ever want to intimidate, no. <laughs> uh, I think wanting to intimidate. People is if you if you're in that kind of business is counterproductive. I actually meant they might be intimidating to you. Oh, intimidating to me. Yeah. I see. Well, that could have been the case with Spare, uh, except that as it says toward the end of the film, but you haven't seen the film, so we can't talk about it very long. He was personally extremely charming and we talked on the telephone before and there was really nothing intimidating about in that way except of course in the larger sense that how are you facing how do you feel facing such a very major war criminal in fact i, I think the part of the intimidating aspect of it is here you have an opportunity as a you know as a journalist, as a historian, and you know, you kind of don't want to blow that opportunity. You want to make That's sure that right. you're asking a question, and that you're gonna, and then if he weasels out of that question, you yes. have a strategy for. And it turned out that all of that was unnecessary. Whatever the strategy might have been, it wasn't necessary because he was so fantastically cooperative. He he offered to show me and the camera. His home movies, for instance, which we see in the which you have seen in the that film. are in the film, uh, and yes, it became probably I would say one of the best, one of the two or three best interviews I've had privilege to make. It does still doesn't answer your basic question, which is indeed about uh, how can I face such a man? That's the question. And I don't have an answer for it. <laughs> it just seemed to me to be part of my job. And, uh, and I was not prepared in no way, in spite of the knowledge I had of his part in all these things, I was not prepared to meet a man so forthcoming. Okay. Now, Dernitz is a little different. Dernitz yes. is not uh, the suave, uh, no. jokey uh, person that, that Albert Speer was. Jokey is a little bit, uh, he wasn't really jokey. Uh, anyway, he, yeah, has some, right. he has some yeah, wit to right. him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Joke. No, doing it. Wrong. Yes. Uh, well, in the film, uh, Telford Taylor was the, the prosecutor. Number uh, uh, answers the question about Sperry. He says the reason he was not hanged while people 
less guilty than he doesn't say it in quite that way, were hanged. I mean, people, ideologues who were not, not bodily, not, not uh, physically involved in the commitment of the crime. Uh, he says the reason is because he was such a cultured man and, uh, and, uh, and charming and that this obviously uh, uh, influenced the judges. So when I went to Germany, I told Speer, I then cut that part of it out, of course, I just confronted him what, with what Taylor had said. And there indeed, there was this very humorous, humorous, not really, this reaction, well, if that's what I owe my life to, then I'm grateful. That's what he says at the end of his, uh, his involvement in the film. But Dönitz, yes. Dönitz is much more defensive and uh, yes. Uh, yes. trying to and move he off has the a, point. He has a much more uh, difficult uh, thing because he did make a terrifically anti-Semitic speech which was part of the Nuremberg Trials. And uh, I do confront him with that. And uh, uh, he has no answer. He's, uh, he's stuck with it. Uh, if it hadn't, uh, uh, that this hadn't, would not have been, uh, if it hadn't been for the poisonous, uh, the poisonous of the, the Jewish race. And, and uh, uh, but, the thing, because you, talk, you were talking earlier, Tom, about um, um, tactics. And I did, I have to confess, I did it more or less on purpose to show up late for that interview uh, uh, so, that, uh, so that he would indeed be. And at the end of the interview, again, what happens off camera is often rather interesting. Uh, he was all like that. You can see it in the film all the time during the interview. And at the end, when I said, OK, uh, thank you very much, he stood up and he said, was I good? Yeah. Human frailty. Was I good? Depends for what purpose. <laughs> for the film, he was good. Um, let's watch uh, another clip from Memory of Justice. This is uh, the opening to the second part of, uh, of Memory of Justice. If you watch it in a movie theater, you've, um, you've been through uh, two hours of some pretty heavy uh, stuff, and you've gone for maybe a 15-minute intermission. You've come back, and uh, and we'll watch the first three minutes of how the second part opens. Um, and you know, one of the things I want to ask you about in this is, is your use of music, because it's, a, I think, a hallmark of, of your uh, filmmaking to, uh, to, to help leaven some of the very heavy it stuff. It has to do. Let me, let me say this before you show the clip. Um, it has to do with show bit. I'm, I'm the son of a very great director, as we said in the, I think is one of the great directors of the 20th century. And my mother was an actress. And my whole approach to Germany has very much to do with that background. Perhaps more than Jewish or not. Very much to do with it. And uh, as a matter of fact, in the second part, there's a whole section on Fritz Kortner, who was a bit my spiritual uncle, was 10 years older than my father, that great German actor, that great, great uh, actor, that great, great Polish actor, reminded me of to be or not to be, uh, but that great, really great German actor. And uh, uh, after this, uh, there is indeed uh, the whole business of, well, what about well, denazification 
and what were the criteria for denazification and what were the criteria for denazification specifically in show business. So uh, that is also the reason why it opens on that particular thing. Okay, all right, so we'll watch this little bit from memory of justice. So uh, in, I mean, that's one example, and there are others in, in Memory of Justice and your other films. There's a uh, clip of a Fred Astaire song at one point in, uh, in Memory of Justice. And, and, you know, as, and as you watch this four and a half hour film, they, they seem to arrive uh, very strategically at moments where you could use a little pause, a little mental break to, um, to take in all these layers of history and uh, and concepts of justice that, uh, that the film is, is taking on. Um, I wanted to ask about your, you, you know, your approach to, to, to using music in, in that way. I think uh, you gave one of the main reasons, which is that I think that between uh, you have to give on such lengthy films uh, while the spectator is watching uh, time not so much to relax but time to digest things as they happen in the film and, uh, and to think about it and it's also a way of tying in one, and also, uh, again, we get come to this issue of, uh, uh, of um, a certain form of puritanism in documentary filmmaking, which was not just, was not part of my temperament. Uh, I, I like to use in all the weapons at the disposal. All that seems to be, can be disposed in order to attract the public and keep it attracted. Attracting the public is not so terribly difficult if, if you have some good advertising and getting people into a theater seems to me not so terribly difficult. It's keeping them there. That is, it, it, and obviously this, with this kind of length, absolutely. Uh, and there are all the threads, all the strings that you can use on a violin. Why not try to use them? You know, it strikes me that for most of your career, the the lengths of your films have been real standouts. There are, you know, very few other documentary filmmakers that we can think of that make films longer than two hours long. Frederick Wiseman is one who's uh, made some uh, longer films. My and favorite film of his, but I don't think there's any link. Between my favorite film of his, I think, is nine hours long. It's called Near Death. It's about the uh, decision making in hospital about when you should turn the valve off. Nine hours of it. Oh, excuse me for interrupting. Yes. No, uh, well, no you know, I'm, I, I'm, I think I'm the pioneer in this matter of filming. But as I tried to explain, perhaps in a defensive way, because I don't really feel terribly guilty about it, it just, uh, it just happened because of circumstance. Well, and in a way, not that um, not that you're part of this uh, now or or need to be, but I think that contemporary filmmaking has finally kind of come round uh, to this because <clears throat> the the current methods of digital distribution, like a Netflix, or, yes. um, have opened up the way for yes. more episodic filmmaking. This year, earlier this year, there was. The series called *The Jinx*, which is a murder uh, mystery investigation that ran six hours on HBO, and yeah. they, so I, I think that at, at long last, that's actually 
<coughs> becoming uh, contemporary? Yes. Well, before that, I don't know so much about the American scene anymore because I don't live here, and I, I, it's difficult to follow such uh, such uh, uh, progressions or changes in tendency from on the other side of the Atlantic. And otherwise, and I live far from Paris, and now I'm out of a lot of things, but not just that. But uh, before, well, there's been Shaw. Absolutely. And, uh, 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 and uh, one film about same subject matter. Uh, I don't know how it was called here. I don't even know if it was shown here. Uh, called Apocalypse, not Apocalypse now, but Apocalypse, about the Second World War with nothing but archival footage and, uh, and which I thought was a very good film. Three or four evenings in a row. Yes, sure. Uh, it was very unusual at the time and only unusual because uh, had it been shown as it was originally intended in two evenings, well, let's come back to that. Had it been shown in two evenings, there's nothing extraordinary about asking a TV audiences to watch two hours of a documentary and then perhaps come back for the second evening because they were interested and thought it was good, then they look at four hours. Not such a big, it wasn't such a big deal. It's only when it was stopped on being shown on French television that the BBC made this decision of showing it in one evening. And it then become, had this apparently pioneering uh, aura. aura uh. And I, I mean, I wonder, you, you being a pioneer in this kind of long format, if you have any reflection on what, what to do with a long format or, or what the strengths of that long format are that, that you couldn't have achieved making shorter films? Ah. The develop, the, to me, the essential thing is the development. When do people in front of a camera stop being conveyors of statements? and become people. To give people enough air, enough air around them, elbow room around them, so that the, the public can get a sense of who they are, seems to be essential. There are also minor things which are more a little bit like jokes. I mean, uh, a, a person who used to be that way, it isn't so much anymore. If you have actors who speak their lines, uh, it comes faster because they've learned the lines. And uh, while with real people, the hesitations are sometimes more important than what they say. The hesitations they have, at what point, and to, to let this breathe. So if the film is supposed to breathe, the people in front have to breathe, and you have to give them time to breathe. Gee. I expressed that rather well. <laughs> uh, well. It's also a good setup to the, the final clip that I had pulled, uh, which is from Hotel Terminus. Um, and this is about the first half of, the hotel, of hotel Terminus. And you're talking to, uh, this is named Robert Taylor? Uh, yes, Robert he, Taylor, so not he, to be confused with Telford Taylor. Right. Yeah, uh, Telford Taylor is at one, the Robert Taylor is in the other. It's there are a lot of Taylors in the world. This Tell one, us who Robert Taylor was. Yeah, no. Uh, there's a whole string in Terminus of, the, of uh, spies and counter-spies who covered what is called the rat line. 
that is all the elaborate system that was put up uh, by the CIA and the people around the CIA to, to get uh, Nazi criminals out of, uh, out of Europe and into South America and was called the Rat Line. And, um, uh, and, and there are some of them, uh, since this is the terminus is about Klaus Barbie and his career. Uh, Actually, I should, I should take a step film. back for people who don't know the film. Yeah. Hotel Terminus, The Life and Times of Klaus Barbie. Uh, Barbie was uh, a, a Nazi who was in France. Uh, in uh, Lyon, yes. And Known uh, as the Butcher of Lyon. And around the time that you're, you were making the film in the 1980s, he, after many years of, of being in hiding, or living in secret, he had been... Pseudo-hiding, because a lot of the French, for instance, knew exactly where he was. They just thought it was a bit of a hot, hot potato to really get hold of it. And when the socialists came in, thanks to Robert Badinter, whose parents were deported by Barbie, uh, the decision was made to bring him back to France. Sorry, I didn't mean no, to. That's a good uh, filling in. And so you embarked on this film because Barbie had been caught. And so this was an opportunity to uh, investigate his history. Also, there's a kind of uh, meditation in this about bringing someone to justice some 40 years after uh, crimes have been committed, finding you know, the trail of, uh, of justice there. And as you've uh, you know, alluded to here, one of, a, a part of that story that I think was surprising to many Americans to hear in the 1980s is that how, how involved the American Secret Service was in all that. In, in actually helping Nazis in helping escape. In helping Nazis escape, including to the United States. And one of the motivations was that they felt that if we don't help these Nazis, the Nazis will get in the hands of the Soviets. People, uh, they, they'll be able to talk. Uh, that was, yes, indeed. That's an it's part of the Cold point. War. Yes, part of the Cold War. They weren't supposed to talk to the enemy, so better get them out and put them away where they are shielded. And so the when most you were making prominent of all of that, of course, was Eichmann. Yeah. Eichmann was in Argentina, and Bobby was in Bolivia, and they all had corresponded with each other, and then it was all a tremendous cover-up. And getting back to Robert Taylor, uh, but I think that comes out in the interview, I'm not sure. Well, before uh, we say that, I'll, I'll just say that around the time that you were making your film, there were other reporters who, were, who had been uncovering information about course, this chapter of, of history, course, about the rat course, line that, course, that helped American course. collusion. And, Naturally, and, yes. And you were, uh, um, and you, in fact, you feature some of those reporters in the yeah, film. You, yeah, you interview yeah. them, giving, and giving them their, their due credit for me, it. Yeah. Um, well, well, that seems uh, logical. But uh, this is a man who actually uh, said that uh, recommended this man to his, his recommended Bobby to his superiors. I'm sort of forgotten about it, so it took me a minute to why he's in the field at all. Uh, he recommended him this Bobby to his superior officers uh, by say that was in Germany, that was before the Rat Line, uh, by uh, saying that. Uh, Bobby was a Nazi idealist. So it all, the interview is around this concept, what the hell is a Nazi idealist, you know? Well, uh, let, let's look at uh, this yeah. clip of uh, okay. the interview with Robert Taylor in Hotel Terminus. I mean, I think that <clears throat> interview is a good example of what you were saying before about letting something breathe. Uh, it's, and that interview clip is, lasts about three minutes long. Frequently in documentary films now, you you know, will be cutting every 30 seconds. Uh, uh. Yes, Tom. Uh, and it's funny because, well, not really funny. Uh, I thought that I should explain, uh, which 
actually needs no explanation because it's on the screen and I forgot about it. I don't spend all that much of my time seeing my own films I made 30 years ago. Uh, one of the reasons I don't is because they're very long. <laughs> such a time. Like you can Cross. perhaps see two or three other films. But uh, the, the, uh, yes, the thing that sticks, stuck to me, and I didn't know whether this would come in the film clip, but it's there. I mean, it, the explanation of why the interview is, is right there at the beginning. Incidentally, there again, I'm not the only one who's asking questions. There is Christopher Simpson, who, um, uh, who was the American, uh, who, who was my uh, researcher in America and the United States, who brought many of the people uh, that we were looking for. But uh, the, the thing that sticks to my mind and stuck to my mind, and perhaps this is characteristic of my frivolity or lack of seriousness, is how unhappy he is that his wife answers the question and takes over the whole thing. That seems to be to be what makes what makes it really interesting. Uh, that he would have made that thing and made that recommendation and talked about Nazi ideology, uh, Nazi idealists. Well, yes, what makes it come alive is the relationship the two have to each other. And that seems to be, be the important part of it. Yes, indeed. Um, so you know, we have a half hour left in, uh, in this session, and I would like to uh, open it up uh, for um, other questions. If, if anyone has one, you can raise your hand, and I'll call on you, and, um, and we can keep this going. And, uh, and until someone does raise their hand, I will continue uh, asking. Yeah, Deborah. I'll just repeat that question for, for other future people that have questions. We have a microphone that we'll bring to you. But the question was, when Sorrow and the Pity finally was broadcast in France, how was it received? Well, but there had been before, there had been because of the fact that it was not shown and because the government said not wanted to show it, there had been uh, a great deal of talk and writing about it and uh, so that uh, uh, it was not all that surprising that when it did come on television a lot of people felt like seeing it because it had become a national uh, issue. Did the government even have a reason to be worried about showing it? I mean, you, you know. Do I feel that they had worried, the reason to be worried about showing it? Or was the reaction at the time that it was finally shown such that anyone caught any guff for? I'm sorry, that <clears throat> I mean, the, the, the fact, when it was finally shown, uh, you know, did, was, was there any kind of? Uh, there were still uh, negative uh, reviews, yes. Yeah. There was still. And was there any controversy were, uh, for the? Was there any it's, controversy it's for the government? It never stopped being controversial, but uh, uh, but it had become uh, part of the whole national discussion about the past, of, uh, which was perhaps the, the controversy. Uh, and you asked me whether uh, I understood the the. Did you ask me that? Whether, uh, yes, at the beginning, it was against the interests of great many political persons and, and uh, even historians to, uh, it went against the grain. It went against the national grain. But as I believe I said before, if the time had come, and if we hadn't made it very soon, rather sooner than later, somebody else would have, I think. Let me ask you about being at the heart of a controversy, because it's not that easy a thing to read articles assailing your film or assailing you personally. Or, 
um, <laughs> uh, including a saving me personally. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I want, and you know, and you haven't exactly shied away from, from controversy no. uh, throughout your career. What, what, is your, what is your attitude towards being at the center of controversy? Uh, trying to, trying to get, uh, trying to be able to take a vacation from it once in a while. <laughs> yes, sometimes it gets a bit heavy, but on the other hand, it's also, uh, it's also stimulating. It makes the blood. The, the, what's the term? Not the blood flow. The blood flows anyway. But uh, the the what? What's the that term? is the term? The blood flow. Even no, though no, the, the blood flow no, fast. The, the adrenaline. Adrenaline. The adrenaline. And that's not a bad thing to have the adrenaline uh, picking you up and carrying you from from one place to another. So no, I mean, would you, do you feel like you've needed to? You've needed oh, no. enemies, sir. That, that is a very good question, but it gets you into a session of psychoanalysis, <laughs> and psychoanalysis only takes 50 minutes, you know. Uh, okay, uh, does anyone have a non psychoanalytic uh, question? No, it's a, it's a, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm not warning you off, I'm just saying. Uh, do I need enemies to make me happy? That's the question. Uh, not initially. I didn't, I didn't, again, I have to point out, uh, the song of the pity was an assignment. So uh, I didn't, I didn't make, I wasn't looking for enemies when I made the song of the pity. It just seemed to me that on the basis of what we knew at the time, those were the facts that should be presented in a film. So, uh, no, no. Uh, still, your question is not unjustified. Again, I don't necessarily have an easy answer to it. Uh, perhaps at the start, not only didn't I need enemies, I probably didn't want enemies. But then over the years, Perhaps I got used to enemies, and at some point it became important for me to have them. It's one somewhat psychoanalytical answer to your very simple question, enemies. Yes, one of the things is about getting to be that old is that so many people I knew have died, and sometimes I have the feelings whether all the friends are gone, the only thing that's left are a few enemies. <laughs> Who do you feel closer to? Francois Truffaut. Um, go ahead, uh, we, we could bring a microphone to this gentleman here. I just wanted to ask about something completely different, and that is your attitude towards post-production and editing. Uh, the question was about your editing process. I mean, you know. Oh, the about the editing process. Yeah. Yes. I don't script in advance. That's one of my difficulties. It's one of the reasons I made enemies, <laughs> since we're talking about <laughs> enemies. <laughs> I don't script in advance. Uh, I find that uh, the idea well, we were talking about a while. How the hell could I know that Spare would want to show us his own movies? Was I supposed to write in advance and then Spare will show us his own movies and write a script in advance? I, even if I wanted to, I couldn't do it. I don't know what is going on. Huh? And also to me, uh, everything that is worthwhile in documentaries seems worthwhile to me, has to do with spontaneity. So not only do I not want, know what people are going to say in advance, 
I, I don't really want to know. I want to be surprised and then try to, to convey that surprise and that moment of life to an audience. That means so that's just a preliminary. I don't have a script. So when I come into the editing room, I write, if it's called writing, I structure. I, everything happens in the editing room. So that finally this whole business about interview and how doing it, I'm really, my attitude is really basically a rather passive one in during filming. I try to film very fast. Same thing with my minutes, apparently. Uh, uh, film fast and then take all the time you need. And again, making enemies because that time producers don't actually feel or think that I should be entitled to all that much time. So again, conflict. But uh, uh, letting things come together in the editing room, getting ideas that one person said this, ah, yes, I remember the other person said that. Let's try to put them together. Let's start to cut from this person to that person because of that. And through that process, uh, a dramatic structure sooner or later takes place. It, 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 it's, it's, uh, yeah, the editing to me is everything. It, it's the very center of creativity. Hi, um, thank you for being here. Um, I just had a question regarding editing. Again, you were just saying that editing is everything to you, that that is, that you really, you really enjoy editing, the process of editing, and you were saying you like to film fast. So when you're going through the hours and hours of footage, at what point, when you're at the two hour mark, do you say, okay, I'm done with this two hours, or what is the structuring? Some ways of indexing. I don't yeah. work alone in the editing room, and, and there are themes that are indexed so that I, uh, so that I know a little bit what connects with what, yes, that's part of it. And so for you, the editing process is the most creative process of producing a film? Is the editing process the most creative process? Yes, to me it's the only creative part of it. The, the other thing is just gathering, you know, uh, a bee, uh, bee uh, goes from one flower to the other, but the honey isn't made while, while the bee is, is flying. The, money, the honey is made afterwards. Well, oh, it's a silly, uh, <laughs> silly one. <laughs> one of the things I experience when I'm watching your films is I feel like the, the film is always one step or two steps ahead of me in, in delivering new characters, in delivering new uh, layers of history. And one of the things I find thrilling about your films is the experience of trying to catch up to how much smarter the film is than, than I am. Um, where, whereas in that should, should put you definitely off. Well, I mean, I think it, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a welcome contrast to so many films where well, you know in advance something is being spoon fed to you. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you, then it is a compliment. <laughs> but I, I wonder how much, you're, how much you think about when you're uh, making films that have complicated history uh, to them. Uh, you know, each character has yeah. their own history and sometimes you it's a very it, interesting it. issue, Tom, uh, because uh, I don't think whatever genre the uh, film belongs to, that it should go leave the spectator behind 
and underinformed. I think it is indeed important that when you, when you get new aspects, that, you, uh, that the film provides, should provide uh, enough so you may be surprised in some, in a, so that you may be surprised uh, at, at getting something at any particular moment because you didn't expect it. But you shouldn't f be surprised in the way that you are underinformed. Uh, this and indeed that is an issue in editing. Yes, it's and again we come to the basic thing with Hitchcock. Uh, it's better for the public to have an advance than uh, if if the protagonist is walking toward danger and death, it's important for the audience to know it rather than to be surprised by it. It's a basic Hitchcock principle. And it should apply to my films. And indeed, if it doesn't, or wherever it doesn't, that is that would be a mistake, uh, a failure, failure. You know, I People mean, I, should be able to keep up with whatever the film provides as it goes. So, I think in a scene like the Robert Taylor interview that we saw, <clears throat> you know, when I watch that, there's a credit that says he was a member of the CIC, and I think, what the hell is the CIC? I don't. You know, it's not the CIA. What, you know, uh, what is that? And but it, in a way, it doesn't matter because there's you get, you're getting enough from that interview, both an emotional content and a historical content. And he's not the only one. There are, I think, four. No, that I I think that you're being a bit unfair because it is explained as you go along. What is the CIC, which was the forerunner of the CIA? Uh, I didn't, mean it, role, I didn't mean it as a critique. Hmm? I didn't mean it as a oh, critique. Well, you, you're perfectly entitled to have to state critiques, <laughs> and we talk about them. I mean, it's one of the reasons for our having a conversation. I think it's perfectly fine. Uh, I think that in the film, if you see it, uh, the information for that particular aspect of it is provided in due time. but. That criticism might still be very valid in in other places and in other contexts. Well, it's a, it's an important issue. I think what, a very important. What issue. I enjoy about these films is when I walk out of them, it gives me an appetite to go read another book or uh, d delve into that history f uh, further, as opposed to a film that ends and you feel and it's wrapped too neatly with a bow. And the hope that when we find ourselves in a dialogue, all the microphones will work. <laughs> uh, speaking of microphones. Not only not getting paid, but not having the mic work is a problem. <laughs> uh, who's, uh, here's a question right here. Perhaps this isn't a fair question. But Sorry? I said, perhaps this is not a fair question, but uh, having just seen this incredibly layered, uh, artistic, creative things that you've done, I have never seen Memory of Justice, but that scene you with his wife. Have, because it's not been, if it weren't for the fact that it's been restored, and I hope you could, will have now the occasion of seeing it, but you couldn't have seen it. Okay, excuse me, Frank. Well, I just wanted to ask you whether you think there have been any good narrative films made about this same subject and same period. Yes. Would yes. you mention them? Uh, about about uh, 
Nazi crimes in general, yes. Uh, my own personal favorite, and I won't give you a whole list, but my own fa personal favorite is Polanski's The Pianist, which is a film on the subject of Nazi crimes. And collaboration. But there are others, uh, Schindler's List, uh, uh, there are quite a few. As a matter of fact, there are so many that once in a while one is entitled to think, well, when will it, when will it be settled? When will it stop? But it's, I, I not an un, it's not a totally invalid question because it keeps being over and over and over again in different contexts. But yes, I think The Pianist is a masterpiece. It's an example. And were you, were you wondering about the subject of collaboration in particular? Oh, collaboration. Oh. You're talking about the song and the pity. Well, it's not the same thing. Uh, well, yes, it. there have been films about that too. Uh, some of which I enjoy, some of which I enjoy less. Uh, mostly French films, as you would expect. La Lucien, for instance. Uh, Louis Mao. But um, as a matter of fact, I, since I picked La Combe Lucien, uh, um, which is a very ambiguous film because it sets up the theory that one could be a, a torturer, a Nazi torturer, and at the same time be in love with a Jewish girl and, and so on. It's, and I remember Louis Mal, whom I knew, and we rather liked each other. But at one time, when I was working in America and La Combe came out, he had said he could never have made La Combe without the song and the pity. And my reaction at the time was very antagonistic, and he knew about it because he read about it. I said, well, if, if perhaps in that case, I better should not have made the film because I disliked it that much. So it all has to do with subjective criteria which are difficult to explain, sometimes impossible. In your films, there is uh, a lot of engagement between history and, and contemporary times in, in that uh, you know, the, the history you're looking at, you're making relevant and indeed is very relevant to w what's happening in contemporary times. Uh, and I wonder how conscious you are of that as a, uh, as a device in your films. I became conscious of that from, again, we always come to that same point. Uh, a reportage, whether it's 10 minutes or 20 minutes or even a little longer, does not need structuring, a storyteller, some way of telling the story, structure. And it is when I gradually came from making reportage, where I think I learned a lot, uh, to uh, that, that the idea became more and more present that you're not, if you, if you make, if, if your subject is contemporary history, it should, it show, should somehow look beyond the present moment that the present moment can be used, but in a larger context. Uh, and yes, the, I think that's the case for most of my films, from the sound video. And uh, was I conscious of that was the question. I think rather early on. It came together with the need of structuring, 
the idea that once you structure, you want to be able to do it on the basis of, of the thing not being a daily occurrence, so it's being perhaps the film about the Berlin Wall has, the Berlin Wall was a contemporary you're, you're event. About, uh, your, yes, your film, November, November Day. Days, yes. which uh, is, um, you made after the fall of, of the, the I of was the Again, Wall. I was asked to make a film by the BBC about the, uh, uh, the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, and the principal problem in that film was that the wall had already fallen. <laughs> Once the wall, so, so it was a matter of finding people. And, but I won't go into the details of that. The, point, the reason I think about it is that uh, the co-producer, the German co-producer uh, of, of the film uh, thought that it was a reportage. But if it had just been a reportage, how could it have been shown on the fifth anniversary, on the tenth anniversary, on the fifteenth anniversary, on the twentieth anniversary? There must have been something in the damn thing that uh, still uh, captured attention. And, you know, and even as we're talking about this, I think of how many films today feel either they fit into a box of this is a history film or this is a film about a contemporary issue. And, uh, and I think your films stand out by overlapping the two, by interweaving the two. Yes, that's, I guess that's the intention that uh, was also a very good question on bringing up that issue, Tom. Uh, what's the difference between a journalist and a historian? It's in the term itself. Jour is the French word for day. A journalist is a man, is a person who, who, who reports about it on a daily basis. And a historian is basically the same thing, except that it's over a long lapse of time. But uh, it has, it's always the same thing. Uh, try to know what it's all about, do the necessary research, and then come up with the goodies. Uh, it seems to me that the idea that historians are somehow uh, more entitled to status than journalists. Well, for one thing, historians couldn't work and do their work if there hadn't been journalists before who had done their work. So uh, at some point, uh, uh, one, one job, one, one task, one assignment melts into the other. And uh, this happened, I suppose, in my films. Uh, without my necessarily thinking all of th these things through. It's with hindsight that we can talk about it. Because, uh, uh, but we have time for one more question. This is your opportunity not available to the people of Bologna uh, <laughs> to, uh, to ask Marcel a little question, aren't you? Yeah, I just want to piggyback on your, uh, I think you said that you were antagonistic at first towards Le Camp Lucien. That you're antagonistic at first to Lucien. Uh, Le Camp Lucien? Le Camp Lucien, Louis Malson. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering, is it because uh, he, at least in my opinion, seemed to make the uh, Vichy, the young Vichy policeman uh, almost uh, innocent and ignorant of his actions. Was it because he, he made the Vichy policeman seem almost ignorant of, uh, and innocent of his actions? Yes, yeah. yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think it is a rather ambiguous and, and nasty film. I think it's, uh, it's also gave, as did other films at that time, a sort of an alibi to people who had not done anything. Uh, and, uh, but 
On the other hand, my attitude toward these things, the danger is, and I don't really want that. I don't want to see myself in that light. I'm not a prosecutor. I'm not a judge. I don't want to be one. Uh, but I react, as you say, uh, antagonism. When I have the feeling that such and such, that's why it came up, such and such a movie on a, is uh, kissing the public's ass. That I don't, I resent in that particular, on those particular issues. Let me, As a matter of fact, I don't like it you know, on the other issues either. Let me, let me ask a final question. We just have two minutes, and then we got to clear the room for the next class. But yeah. uh, ambiguity is at the, the center of your films. Your films don't really seem to be a search for black and white. They're, they're an exploration of the gray. Is that a fair way to describe Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Uh, I think that life is ambiguous and trying to find a shortcut through those ambiguity by adopting one, one ideology or another uh, is, is being unfair to yourself and unfair to others also. Uh, ideological approaches are poisonous. And uh, they have been in the 20th century, and I'm afraid they will be again. Ideology is always some sort of, of way of shield, shielding oneself from the complexities of life. And so reminds me of what my favorite film before the war, my favorite American film. My father was the one, even on the, in Paris before the war, who said, oh, you should go see such and such a film. And there's a film by one of my great idols, Frank Capra, called uh, You Can't Take It With You. And there's a place where Lionel Barrymore, who's more or less the chief, said, uh, says, communism, fascism, voodooism, everyone see, looks for an ism these days. Uh, well, looking for an ism, I think, is uh, not a good idea. Marcelo Fools, thank you very much for taking the time with us.